To whom much is given, much is required. Part of that requirement is sharing. Culture is the heartbeat within our lives, and it's at the core of so many things. While we live in a time when we are starving for wisdom, I welcome you to your wisdom retreat at Culture Raises Us. Matt Hatfield, today's guest, uh, founder, CEO of Nice Kicks, which is something that was launched back in 2006 with a, a mission to provide shoe enthusiasts accurate and credible news and information and history about sneakers. I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing him since the early 2000s and super excited to share his story. But before we do, uh, I would love to get your thoughts on when you hear culture, what does that mean to you? To me, when I hear culture, I think of the the actions, so the verbs there, um, and the visuals of such as arts, of things that are important to a group of individuals. Okay, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I met you when I came back to Nike um, for my second stint in two thousand and ten. Uh, and Nice Kicks also had a retail location at that point, I believe in Austin, right? Yeah, that was, yeah, in 2010 is when we had opened. Uh, yeah, so. and, and I remember bringing a team down there for, for market travel, and we met there, and you were like the consummate, consummate host, and you had a great offering of product, a very pristine presentation of that product experience as well. And to now see how you've evolved your offering with the focus on the content, which is where you started, is a great example for me that represents the evolution of kind of this footwear culture. And footwear obviously plays a very, very significant role in kind of shaping culture as we know it, right? And being a key destination of, of where these stories become so powerful from a content standpoint, I would love to get your thoughts on if there was a particular moment where you realized just how big and instrumental this footwear culture was to overall culture in life. Yeah, so I mean, it was very important for me in in high school um, and middle school. But I think that I'll share first the story of where I really knew this thing was huge. Mm -hmm. When my family moved to the Caribbean, and we moved to the island of Grenada, and I walked in for the first day to my classroom, and I had this all I had the my first pair of Jordans were like one of two or three pairs of shoes I brought with me. And it was um, an almost all black shoe. And I was able to wear those to school. with mm -hmm. And I walked in and the, here, here the kid, um, like a couple of people in my classroom, just like lose their minds because they saw they were getting to see the new Air Jordans. What, what number was it? 14. Jeez. Okay, continue. Yeah. So um, that to me was when I was like, oh my goodness, this sneaker thing is not an American thing. This no. is much bigger than that. Um, before that, this was when I was in the 10th grade in uh, the ninth grade, I had, I had gone to a school in Fresno, California, and I didn't, I had like hard time, like understanding how to connect and communicate with others. Mm -hmm. But what I did notice was people's shoes. And, um, I've, those who know me can make fun of it all the time. Like I really obsess over certain things. If I really get into something, I obsess <laughs> over it. So when I got an East Bay catalog, I didn't just like flip through the pages. No, no, no. I had to memorize every model. I needed to know oh, wow. them in each. I, I mean, I just obsessed over it. Um, but what I found was like when I went to this school, I was able to break the ice to have a conversation with somebody over their shoes. It was a language. It was a yeah. common language. So, yeah, that was where and I'm like, wow, shoes are a way I can connect with others. Yeah. So when you talk about it as a language and then you even talk about the way in which we consumed the information there, even like an eBay, um, uh, East Bay, excuse me, the, the catalog that we all used to get in the mail. Now, obviously, over the years, the sneaker culture has experienced a significant shift and evolution. How do you think this evolution has kind of impact the retail landscape? And what role has Nice Kicks played in kind of shaping this transformation? So I think like sneakers, like everything is changing, right? Not yeah. just the product uh, that are, is going to evolve, but the companies that sell them. Um, but really the, the landscape of how and why people buy shoes is ever changing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today's consumer has very different priorities from 
ours when we were their age. Yep. You know, so um, they're it, it, certain it's going to be take a very different thing that gets them excited about uh, purchasing a product. And I think f- what we have seen uh, through time is that we at least when I started really getting into shoes as a consumer is like at it was right before we had these specialty retailers around sneakers and sneaker culture. Um, and you know, early two thousands, this was a very, very small, small niche thing. I mean, the pair count that was produced on uh, some of the products. I mean, I don't even want to know what the margins were at, when you're making 50 pairs of something. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, it's one of those things. Like, I don't think something like that would be greenlit today, honestly. Right. Um, to see it go from something so niche to something so broad, it inevitably had to be very different. Mm-hmm. Not just for um, what was made, but who it was made for and how it was sold. And so, I think what we've just seen is that this this sneaker category is starting to mature into like a full blown mainstream business where it is. Um, so the way that we see retail today is very much like not like kind of translates the way the retail was for the masses when we started buying shoes. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's much more built around volume than necessarily the emotion of the consumer when you're at, um, at going through the process. Yeah. Which, which sometimes for me as even a, a consumer still, and as, an, and as an executive within it, that part is, is dearly missed because I think you, you can attest to the connectivity and the experience we all felt with those highly coveted, hard to get um, drops, or whatever you want to call them, at that point where, I mean, there's an element of that now, but now it's evolved into sometimes you can't even get it if you're not in the first two minutes of this thing dropping and it's now birthed this other market of kind of this resale business model, which I think has seen a significant amount of growth over the years. And there's a, a component of that that I love in terms of the entrepreneurial piece, but we, we can get to that. How, how do you perceive that shift? And what do you think contributed to the increasing demand and desire to kind of partake in purchasing product from a third party at an elevated price point? Yeah. Well, I think um, I'm going to first uh, address the first part about the whole experience shift. Um, yeah. Because I think like I've been sounding the alarms now for like six or seven years with with brands about this, which is that the way that things are the, the way that things trended to and the way that things have been for quite a few years was not an enjoyable one for consumers. Mm. You know, the idea of the way that product is bought, you know, the you know, you, for a while there was fastest finger wins kind of thing. Now right. it's like the best bot or who paid the best kid who runs a bot to get you your shoes. And your experience of your first touch point with that product is a UPS guy drops it off on the doorstep and you just hope it didn't get stolen. You open it up. It's like, that's your first touch with the Mm. You compare that to what you and I went through where we went, we went to a store, we were immersed in a brand experience that started before we even asked if they had our size in the shoe. That's right. That's right. So. The, the emotion that the consumer, the, the consumer has been so robbed of this emotional experience that was so taken for granted. Mm. It was set to the side for what's the most efficient way to drive the most number of sales. And I don't think that people saw what was the second order effect of sanitizing the whole experience of the emotional experience. And what I say, uh, what a phrase I often say is like, there aren't that many retroable moments and retroable experiences. And that's talking about the consumer, not the product or the athlete, the consumer. How many current experiences are people having where they say in eight years, oh my gosh, I can't wait to relive that. Mm, that's gone. That's they've been, You said it. You said they've been stripped of that experience. And I, I agree and the way you 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 walked us through, even the the receiving of it currently is the UPS guy dropping it at your door or gal, and you hoping that it has not been taken, destroyed, or just like that's the experience now. Yeah, that's the experience. And I and I saw it like back in 2013 or so. 
I started seeing brands, they were hitting up um, influencers. They even hit us up um, about some campaigns. They're like, yeah, we want you to unbox online purchases. I'm like, you guys have retail stores. Why would you not want to organize the campaign of us going to your physical store to experience your physical store and buying the shoe? Like you are saying, just go open a box. I'm like, anybody can just ship you a box. That's right. You guys, are, you guys are accelerating your demise. What are you doing here? Like you're promoting people to stop going to your stores. It, like, it is. It is. No yeah. Do, do you do you do you see a do you see an opportunity to come back? And I don't want to call it a back, but to return to that space. So I often use this line of a comeback doesn't need to be a go back. I think a comeback. Yeah. Yeah, shout out Oprah. I, she had a podcast where she had a guest who dropped that. I, wow, say that one more time from good old Oprah that correlates to so many different things. Say that one more time. Man. A comeback does not need to be a go back. It could be a step forward. Absolutely. I mean, I like a comeback in, in so many ways should be greater than you were before, right? Mm. What do you achieve? If all you've done is just gone back to what equilibrium a couple years later, that's lost time. No, you know, like, yeah. So I think that a comeback can happen for this space. But what's going to have to happen is that people are going to have to go back to their roots. And by people, I include brands with this, like yeah. within brands are going to have to champion for what made this space red hot. What mm -hmm. made this the center of culture? What made this the industry that inspired other elites from other industries. You know, footwear has that, ha footwear had that for so many years. I mean, I just watched a video of Steve Jobs from the mid 90s talking about the emotion that Nike invokes in its consumers, that they don't push the product. They don't tell you about how, how much better their air is than Reeboks. They make you feel better with it. They make That's you right. inspired by it. That's what's missing. And you know, so what's crazy is that the footwear industry still has the credibility and the ability to shift again mm -hmm. and for consumers and people and industries to follow. So it's that that equity is still there for sure. So because, you know, some industries you can have this conversation like the car industry, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think the car industry can move culture the way that the footwork industry can move culture if it chose to make its comeback. Exactly. Well, look, you know, Nice Kicks, I, I think, has really cemented itself as a prominent player in the sneaker culture, and I want to applaud you for that. Share some of the insights or, or the strategies that have kind of enabled your platform to kind of maintain this relevance um, within this space and um, kind of your thoughts on, on that well I mean I think that nice kicks has is very much one who's had comeback stories throughout its history I mean we've been I've been going on this now for like two plus decades and we've had our peaks and valleys and you know there have been times where we've had maybe not like complete bottoming out but just not momentum on our side of, of mm -hmm. things and maybe that's just me internalizing how I feel about like where things are but I really feel like you know in recent times, we had really a huge comeback for us as a as a organization starting in the pandemic when there was this great reset that happened and we had a whole new direction of the way we approached content and what our position was going to be um, to the marketplace and really inwardly reflecting about like, what are our values? What matters to us? What do we want to lead with out to the market? Um, but I think that the most important thing that any brand can do is there's this, there's this constant problem that a lot have, and we, I was definitely guilty of it is trying to do all that others can do. And rather than be doing like focusing so much on what is truly you, what is truly unique about you and what you feel so natural about, um, the most. And it yeah, your like, uniqueness. What's your unique proposition? And, and leaning into that, and not the me too. Exactly, exactly. And so for us, like the consumer has always been that. Yeah. Like from day one, like when we launched, 
we launched with a comment section for a reason on the blog. You know, mm -hmm. there was a reason why we were on MySpace from the very beginning. We embraced social media comment sections from the very jump because it wasn't just about the shoes. It was always about the conversation and the stories around them. Mm. Like, and then when we got into that and we started reflecting more and more, and I really credit uh, former creative director Gabe Ocean and, you know, the, at the time is understudy uh, Des on my team who really like said like, okay, it's not just the conversation of, around the product, but also the conversation amongst the people. And how do we elevate what is it? What is it that everybody's saying? Like identify mm -hmm. what it is and helping to, you know, bring that forward. It sounds like you were, you were developing a, a community. What it, it's audience development. Yeah. Developing a community. Talk about, you know, cause as we talk about community, there's different influences and influencers within respective communities. And I think we're at a place where there are new arbiters of, of what I call influence that I think first, the time frame that we're talking about, it, it was very heavily rooted in sports, very heavily rooted in sports. But now it's kind of evolved into music, fashion and entertainment. Talk about your thoughts on that and how and what that whole transformation or transition to. Yeah, huge. So, I mean, since the dawn of time, the arbiter of influence in footwear came from athletics. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 first professional athlete that I can find that had a shoe deal was a Canadian badminton player, Jack Purcell. And he had no. it with Goodrich. Um, shortly thereafter, you had some pro athletes um, that had other tennis shoes. Chuck Taylor, there's a lot of debate. Is he a professional athlete? Was he semi-pro? They kind of created the team for him. Like, you know, there's a lot of debate on that one. Um, but it wasn't until like, you know, about the, like, the 50s and Bob Cousy where you really had like pro athletes in the big leagues with a signature product. But that continues on for many years. You know, we saw and things just got taken to the stratosphere with Michael Jordan. Um, but like kind of what was, and then for after the Michael Jordan moment, for many years, you had every brand trying to find who was the next Mike. That's who right. Michael Jordan, who was the next Michael Jordan? Nobody ever stopped to say, wait a second. We need to find the next thing that was like the Michael Jordan, but it didn't, it was not going to be in basketball because you can't be right. the first and it'd be like, you're just not going to recreate that new right. form lightning in the bottle and what we saw when i saw like um it's ironic because i think that at the time like adidas had something with run dmc in 85 and i don't think that yeah. anybody kind of <coughs> recognized it really at the time um in, in what was there right but i saw like in the late 2000s even just myself as as a as a consumer like i learned much more about sneakers not from the athletes but like by flipping through the source and double xl there you go. Like on Air Force One on the wall, that wasn't my first time seeing the shoe. I'd seen it in the double XL in the source a million times over, you know, the right. rock ads and everything like that. Jay wearing them. So I think music and entertainment became the next arbiter of influence for the sports space or sorry for athlete, uh, sneakers space. And that really grew with Kanye like that, re like in, in 2009, and with his Air Yeezy, I mean, that was a huge... Polarizing. Polarizing. Yes. Polar oh, I remember the controversies at Nike. Like, how could you... How dare you give Did someone a non right. shoe? That's right. That's right. And... Polarizing. Yeah, polarizing there. But then, you know, he continues on. And it, then I, it wasn't shortly there after he joined with Adidas that I think we saw the start of the third wave of Arbiters of Influence, which I think comes from design. And I think of people like Virgil Abloh, Salehi Bembury. I think of those two individuals, a Finn Rush Taylor, of a more, you know, more modern uh, or more current uh, guy. Um, Aaron Preston, people who are designers in their own right of, of multidiscipline designers, they are developing followings of people who follow them as individuals and are inspired by them as individuals and are they're fans of their creations, their designs as art, like kind of like art rather than being so tied to the brand message or mm -hmm. period. Like actually now as I mention it, those four individuals I just mentioned all have done footwear 
concurrently with multiple brands. That was like unheard of in the old days. You're right. You're right. You couldn't wear Nike and Adidas. No. That's right. It's, it's a totally new day. And I think that new day is reflective of the evolution of the industry, of our world, um, the embracing of individuals like the ones you mentioned as these credible artists who were really just painting a different picture on a different canvas now, right? They all painted their respective pictures. When you think of uh, Ye music, right? He had been painting amazing, beautiful pictures in the music scene. And now he's now crafting that on a shoe. Virgil, same thing. All these individuals had their area Selegi, who actually was a footwear designer at Kohan, right? I don't know a lot, if a lot of people know that. Um, but all of them had their respective canvases, and this was just another canvas, which I think is actually a beautiful thing that artists can now step out into different areas and paint different pictures on different canvases. And a shoe is just that. It's probably one of the more powerful canvases. Um, but with that, you, see, while sports has kind of taken that back seat somewhat to these other pillars within our culture offering, do you feel like there's a, a resurrection or a resurgence happening within this space at all of sport coming back? I think there is. I think the thing that everybody's got to throw out their old formulas they were trying to use. They yeah. need to re approach it like in a new way. And I think, I mean, credit to what Puma has done with LaMelo Ball. Yeah. I, like no mistake with what's going on there. I think, you know, a lot of people, not enough credit is given to what Under Armour did with Curry. They took it. Talk, 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 talk about that. Well, what, what do you think? Give me your, your, your breakdown there. I think that with LaMelo Ball, so, I mean, LaMelo is was already like in his own right, such a huge star in the sport of basketball before ever stepping on. To yeah. Him. Given his family, the father, the brother. I, yeah. I, I heard this line in like 2017 and I, I'll never forget it is that he's the Justin Bieber of basketball. <laughs> the Justin Bieber and give the context. Justin, of the he, he was such a star. I remember at one time, Nick DePaul on our, on my team did this. He checked out how many, how many athletes he had more followers on, on Instagram. I mean, like there was a time where I think there were only two or three NBA guys who had more followers on Instagram than LaMelo Ball. Like it before was, he was in the league. Before he was in the league. Like it was just, Jeez. it was insane. Like, I mean, I, LaMelo Ball was a huge star before he showed up really. Yeah. And, I think what's really awesome about that is that we talk about what's going to reinvigorate this space. It's exactly this. I think Le like I think Bronny James already has. He might not have as much attention on him as his dad did because obviously we had very uh, controlled centralized media. Yeah, um, but the number of people Bronny's age who are aware of him it far exceeds the number of teenagers who knew of LeBron James before LeBron was coming in. Mm, I get it. And then talk to me about the Steph piece with Under Armour. I mean, I think the Steph piece, they, they lean, they, one thing that they were able to do with Steph was that they were able to lean into the underdog story with him, mm. which, you know, a lot of times in, a lot of times, I mean, how many big athletes like to be known as the small guy or, right. or, you know, the guy who was like the little engine that could like, not a lot of people want that. Especially if right. you've been a champion, especially if you're trying to assert like I've been born great kind of thing. Like there's this, right. this whole like thing of like I've always been the best. And they came in with like the underdog story, the guy who was skipped over, the guy who every you know kind of just like left on the draft table. And yeah, I think yeah. for a lot of young young boys that you know that's a primary, at least in those years, primary uh, basketball sneaker purchasing category like i think there's there is something to be said for like you kind of want to be seen as that underdog who's going to be great yeah you know for me as i look at that i and i think back to a comment you made about brands not looking for the next michael jordan but looking for the next thing that kind of makes sense and that has this point of differentiation but can still be in the realm of a, a jordan but not trying to be jordan but be jordan like in doing leaning into the thing that makes them special. And when I look at the Steph opportunity with Under Armour, 
I feel like there was something left on the table by not leaning into the kids' business in a more oh. bold, galvanizing way, right? Because, Matt, let me tell you something. Any parent wants their child to be like Steph on and off the court. Why would you not create a more significant kids' business? You, you, you lean into the audience who are holding the dollar for their kids, which are parents. They want them to emulate and be like somebody. They're going to buy the Steph Curry shoe. Why don't you flip the business model and make it 70 to 80% kids, 20% adult, and run your race? I felt that was a miss because Under Armour was trying to follow the blueprint of what everybody... So we've got to have our signature shoe, signature business. We need this men's business to be so big. Uh, you could have made, you could have ate so well by having your, your kids' business be the lead and then grow with them to then be able to take them on the journey of now being your adult core business. Yep. I, that was the miss. I mean, honestly, I think that at that time, Under Armour was trying to do too many things at once. Yeah. They were, trying, they were trying to do athleisure. They were trying to do artists like entertainment collabs. They were trying to do so many things at once. And honestly, like they had the pressure of wall street, wall street wanted press releases of them doing new things. Like there was a whole lot going on there, but I completely agree with you. Had they put much more focus on kids business, they would have annihilated that space. Annihilated. Annihilated. Cause I, so I found that I, and I saw the potential of Curry's thing being enormous. Cause I had young cousins from the Midwest and Curry was the most celebrated guy. Yeah. And it's for obvious reasons because right. what so, doesn't want their child to look up to that player. The NBA. Right. You know, you know, part of this, I look at athletes as kind of in, in the same vein, a little bit of like brand collaborations. Right. And they've come, they've become, I think so prevalent now within the sneaker industry. How, how do you see this phenomenon kind of shaping consumer behavior and what impact do you think it has on the overall culture of sneaker enthusiasts and collectors? Well, I mean, one thing that I, we've started to see finally is that brands had this old model of old blueprint of somebody signs on as a signature athlete and it was kind of maybe not a lifetime deal, but career deal. Right. And I think that brands are now going to need to get much quicker to sign short, shorter term signature deals with some of their athletes. Um, I think that the idea or the expectation of you make one signature signature shoe in their third season, you're going to be on, you know, this player's eighth model by the time they retire, like just doesn't, it just is not sustainable, especially if yeah. you're always wanting to find new talent to put on. So I think that brands need to be quicker on, you know, I, a line I like to say is pull, you know, you pull the plug, you, you pull the oil out of the engine, not when it has to be replaced. You do it before it needs to be replaced mm -hmm. more often. So you're saying then that the collaborator model is one that makes sense that should be incorporated into that of the endorsement deals that are happening with athletes. Right? I think that I think that you can do that. It just it just needs to. Yeah, I think just overall, you need much more turn the what the problem that i i felt had been plaguing basketball was that it just got very formulaic you mm -hmm. know like, oh this month it's going to be the new kd oh then it's the new pg and then oh it's the new Kyrie. and then 12 months out you're like oh it's that same order again oh mm -hmm. one more on each one and you know for there is something to be said for you you don't want to necessarily kill off a line that has a great following um but i think that brands need to be quicker to change out some of the lines if they're yeah yeah but and there is a sense of you know repetition is reputation right you, you want to have some sort of consistency but to your point that there, there has to be some uh some wow moments of surprise and something that is you know not not expected the unexpected can add on to that repetition a little bit yeah and i think it also didn't help that when you went to any retail store that carried the basketball category of a specific brand, all the same models were pretty much available at each one. Maybe once in a while you'd have a colorway that wasn't here, wasn't there. But I'm like, right. 
why is it you couldn't just say like this retailer is only going to carry these two athletes this retailer is only carrying these two or this one based on price point because we already know based on demo data that that's kind of the way that a lot of that that retailer works so why is it that you show up and everybody has the full lineup of that brand's yeah. basketball category like so well yeah well you know those were interesting times with interesting retailers who had a whole lot of power for all the wrong reasons and dictated a lot of that very much so. Yeah. Very yeah. Much so so uh, the term hype beast has yes. become this significant uh, descriptor within sneaker and streetwear community. How do you think this subculture has kind of influenced the overall perception and consumption of product? I mean, I always heard to me that the term was a, was like. I mean, that was almost like a slur to somebody like yeah. who was in sneakers. Like that was like a, the, that was such a diss to call somebody a hype beast. How about that? Getting into it saying I'm such a hype beast, like smiling, but I'm like, what? What, 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 what year is this? You know? We're um, so the idea and like, do you not know what that w word means? Like that word means like you buy things for no reason other than you saw other people. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're just you okay, so you're just a follower? Like you're just declaring yourself I'm not a free thinker, I'm a follower. Okay. Um this hype beast culture was this weird phenomenon that that took hold where you saw a lot of street primarily streetwear brands lean into it. Um you know, they built good community and good followings off of it. Um but the, the problem that I always found with it is that if you build your business around somebody who's just going to be follow the leader, they'll just as easily go follow something else soon. That's right. That's right. So, There's no loyalty there. Yeah. It's all, I mean, go back to that, you know, start with why Simon, shout out Simon Sinek. Like, why are they buying your product? Why are they engaging with you? If it's a very cheap reason, it'll be a very cheap reason for them to not be engaged anymore. I love that. Yeah. Tell me about some challenges that you've had to face in maintaining, you know, off of that answer just now, some off your authenticity, your credibility within the sneaker and streetwear community while staying true to the values of nice kicks. I mean, just based off of even what you just said. I mean, one of our biggest challenges we had was honestly when we opened the retail store, um, because you had now to j balance the thing of running a business where you needed to sell product as well as also having a voice of always keeping it honest about how you feel about different products. Brands, yeah. And not every brand really liked that um, kind of thing. You know, they didn't like <laughs> I'm it. I'm sure. <laughs> not everyone was a fan of that. And <laughs> it was a tough conversation. And honestly, like that was, I think that for us, like why you know, we, it, we were much happier going back to our roots of conversation and media and social media around sneakers than, uh, playing, you know, balance game of both. So yeah, what, what prompted you to go into the, the retail space in the first place? Man, I, it's, it goes back to everything. It's for me, it's all about the emotion and the experience ah. because I wanted to create a space. First off, I always called it nice kicks, like retail space or nice kick space. I didn't, like I had, I had this really thing from early mission was that I wanted people to have an amazing experience at this space where they could actually see and experience what nice kicks represent as a brand in real life. Cause remember at this time we were only a blog and a Twitter account right? Uh, and a MySpace page. And, um, I wanted people to be able to walk in and experience shoes in a certain way that they probably hadn't before, but actually see what it would feel like to what nice kicks his values are so that's mm. why like, that whole space was decked out the way it was with the art on the walls it's beautiful it's beautiful the beautiful displays that i cre that i had you know curated of things that you know that synced with whatever was for sale at the time i i was just like i wanted to create something where people would walk in and feel an emotion around the brand uh and if they bought something awesome really was like the retail store was, you know, kind of like a gift shop, you might say, you know, like I just wanted people to have that kind of space. So that was, that's really what it came from. And the reason I, I, I really got hooked into that was that when I had started out blogging, like my first connections uh, in the whole space were retail uh, store owners. Oh. So Jen Ford from Premium Goods, Ray Odom, yeah. uh, 
kicks in the Odom group down in Houston. Derek Curry, I, that was a long drive out to Lafayette. Uh, Louisiana, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, I'm forgetting the name of the guy up in Addict, uh, Dallas. Uh, but I would go to these retail stores all the time um, to learn about the business and you know get information on upcoming shoes as well. Um, mm-hmm. At that time, like the brands like didn't think blogs were real or that online media was a thing. Like it's like if we didn't have a, a, a print magazine, a television show or a radio program, we weren't considered media by brand. That's right. That's right. So that like retail stores was the only way I could ever learn about anything. So I think from spending so much time with those individuals and hearing why they started the, their stores is why I really wanted to create a space of my own. That's dope. That's dope. In your opinion, do, do you envision the future of uh, the sneaker industry? How do you envision it? And and what trends or developments do you anticipate will have like this significant influence on the market in the coming years? So I think we're going to see um, a pretty big change on the in the the retail setting. Um, I think we're going to like experiential retail is going to really matter. Yeah. Undifferentiated retail is there's they're due for a huge culling. Uh, you know, 2024 is going to be a bloodbath for a lot of stores. Mm. Uh, and but I think that like while it's you know it's oftentimes people think of like stores closing as a very sad thing. I think the thing that it does do is that it's the natural selection of what are the best businesses and the best experiences for consumers. That's right, and they'll rise to the top. Exactly. So it actually then. As as the mediocrity kind of goes away, it helps the good ones come out on stronger footing for consumers to create more experiences and open more doors. So I think right. that's a good thing. Um, but I think that what we're due for, honestly, I think we're due for a big disruption in um, it, uh, on on the way shoes look and the way they're manufactured. Um, mm. Two those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so I saw like. You know, one of the first, like in, in recent times, one of the big shifts that we saw in the way shoes looked as well as manufactured, because they two always have gone together, uh, was when we had those knitted uppers um, mm. done. That really changed and shook stuff up. I remember when they came out, I was like, oh, this is so amazing because you can make, uh, you know, small runs of them quite easily. Yeah, flying. Um, yeah, you make, yeah. And then the other thing too is like, you know, with all you're having to do is, print out that upper um and then cut it and do a small stitch and then glue it to an outsole i was like you know it's not gonna it wouldn't be that hard to get one of these printers or sorry one of these um one of these uh looms uh close to the consumer <coughs> import the outsoles and make the shoes on demand very close to the consumer mm. it, it, that never came to be i always hoped it would um, I know that some people in Mexico had set these up, but nobody in the U.S. did. Um, but then in um, when uh, Kanye and Adidas started doing things around the slides and the foam runners, I Ooh. really saw what is the start of where I think we're going to see a lot of things change in the way the shoes look, which is the EVA injected shoes became a thing. Like they really did. Do you think that kind of helped that now that you're talking about this, do you think that kind of helped the, the crotch phenomenon? Without question. Kanye to EVA was Kanye to boost that Michael Jordan was to air. Ooh. What they were is they were the cultural, you know, validation stamp that became the catalyst for discovery and acceptance by the masses. You know, mm. air existed before MJ. That's right. For several years. But as soon as you had the Air Jordan, all of a sudden now people were like, wait a second, what is that Air they're talking about? That's right. You got so in love with it that it only took two more years that Nike had to put it on display for all to see. Kanye did the same for Boost. Bo- the Ultra Boost had been out. Boost came out with the Energy Boost in 2013. Ultra Boost comes out in twenty end of 2014 or 2015. Kanye wears... The all white ultra boost now all of a sudden okay now it's it's validated to the masses that's they right go and try it out they're like oh my gosh what have i been missing and i think the same thing happened with eva it was like adding that stamp of approval and cool to this that now um that really elevated the whole eva space authenticated it he authenticated it 
exactly. authenticated. Uh, what advice would you offer to kind of young entrepreneurs looking to establish their presence within this ever evolving sneaker culture? So presence, I really want to lean in on that word. Hmm. Presence is getting face to face on the ground with your hands on this business. Presence is not a social media account with followers. Right. Your presence where you are physically in the space and you are learning from other people about this business is how you're going to really establish a presence for yourself in this industry. I think a whole lot of people want to do things remotely, but you're not, there's just so many little things afoot where that you just are going to, you're just not going to be able to pick up online. No, you got to be hands on. I agree. You have to be hands on. And, and also too, I really stress that whole presence thing. I think like, I get the idea of wanting, you know, a name for yourself. And I, but I think so often people care more about the spread of the name than the, the, the substance behind the name of what you've learned and who you've worked with and all that other stuff. I think, I think your presence comment goes way beyond just this industry as an entrepreneur. I think as a community of people, um, presence is a big thing because while we are present in times, we're really not. If you look at the time we spend on our phones, the time we're just head down, we're not really present. So are we really getting the best out of each other and all of us? No, we're not. So I, I'm so glad you, you provided that insight for entrepreneurs in this space. But I do think that's something that correlates and is transferable into even bigger conversations um, regarding us as a society of people um, and, and, you know, as a community of people. So thank you for, for articulating that so well. So look, the, the, Matt, the Matt documentary is about to begin. The opening scene to your life documentary. What song is playing and why? Oh my goodness. Whew. Oh my goodness. I, I'm I'm going through all the different music that's been like so important in my life. But like that that's what, what punches through. Something is punching through though. Something's punching through. Man, you do you have any idea how many eras of music I've had in my life? <laughs> I, so, I, I do I'm probably right behind you. I grew up so early nineties country was so huge for me. Okay. So I family watched CMT every single night. Dick, uh, New Orleans jazz was my first real love with music. Nice. Um, that's before before all the sneaker stuff. You know, my life playing you know jazz was that was everything. I mean, I'm nice. looking at my banjo I got up here in my office still. Nice. Uh, Remember, this is just the opening scene. It's the opening scene. We're gonna have a lot of other. The, the score is gonna encompass all yeah. the variety of songs and music. That open scene, though. Yeah, I will say, like, listen, you get a nice riff, a nice banjo riff. Like, that is a really good opening scene music. Okay. You know? Okay. I love it. I'll take it. Hey, and I mean, Dre used it for, for, he used a banjo, he sampled the banjo for Still Dre. I, you know? That's right. Is there a particular song or just the banjo in general would be the lead kind of? Oh, man. I'm having a hard time with this one. I don't even know which one I'd do. I don't even know which one I'd do. But it would be banjo century. I think you got to go banjo something on that. I love it. I love it. No, if you like it, I love it. So listen, yeah. we always end these sessions with, you know, providing three seeds that you'd want to leave with the stewards of culture moving forward. Very much the correlation to like a farmer. Would love to hear your thoughts on what three seeds you think are critical that you'd want to make sure... If nothing else, people walk away with this. I think that one of the most important things that people need to do is be looking out for and prior prioritizing themselves. Hmm. I think that we have, um, I think it is a really weird thing that um, we have made the word selfish be something of a negative connotation in that we 
when we hear the word selfish, we are thinking often that you are putting others, you're, you're deprioritizing others. Or oftentimes selfishness is often like it's paired with a large ego. Right. I, that, I think that, that the self and ego are two very, very different things. If you prioritize yourself, and that includes like your health mm. and doing what matters most for you, it's amazing how all the people around you are going to get the best version of you. And benefit. I love that. And benefit from that. And also too, I, I mean, I've got four kids. They've seen their dad go from somebody who was far from healthy. And they see mm. a dad now who is at the healthiest shape of his life at 39 years old. Mm. And, you know, maybe there's times one might say, oh, you're, you're not putting your children first enough. Like you might not be there at breakfast when they wake up or you're not there to make them breakfast. When you wake up, you're still out running. Or mm -hmm. you're I want, I would love for them to see how much, you know, and I, they, they've seen it, how much me prioritizing my health has made me a better, a better father. <coughs> love, love and that. I would love for them to do the exact same, thing. exact same thing. Good for you. Good for you. Love that. That's a good one. Yeah. So, um, similar to that, I think that this goes for in, in life and, um, and career, follow your values. Mm -hmm. What matters to you? Because anytime you're doing something that's not within your values, you're out of alignment. Yeah. When you're out of alignment, it causes stress. Yeah. And when you're, when you cause the stress, you now then have to spend other types of energy to bring yourself to that alignment. So the more that you can do things within your values that are you, the better you will be. Mm. Yeah. That's two. And I think the third one kind of ties to the, the second one in a little bit of a way, which is really think of what, what makes you happy. What, what doesn't feel like work? Do that. And do that. Like, I mean, I started selling shoes when I was 16 years old at the, at the, at the shoe store in the mall. I've been in footwear ever since I've loved, yeah. of course there's been ups and downs, but you know, I am so glad I listened to my father's advice when he's he said to me, no matter what it is, make sure you're doing something you enjoy. That's right. Because I, you know, he, he did a lot of great things for in his career. He did a lot of things that were fueled for financial reasons. Um, but I know he never really did what he really loved. Really loved. So, yeah. So you weren't going to miss that opportunity. Listen, man, I, those three that you shared and the focus that it puts on you as an individual, um, I think is a, a, a great, great help um, in a way, again, as you talked about the selfish piece, but bringing it back into what that really means um, and that component allowing you to be the best version of yourself, which then is the best version for everyone who comes in contact with you, i.e. even your own children, is outstanding. And I, I want to thank you for being a reflection of it, right? We didn't talk about your your health journey and your wellness journey, which I've, I've been able to watch from the sideline um, and just see you transform. Like you've transformed. You're like, you're like a different person. You've evolved. And your health is wealth. Priority is number one. Right. And you can hear it in your voice. You could hear it in how you even spoke to the seeds and, and what that means for your children of, of what was the thing before of being there and present to make breakfast every morning to now you at times are not able to do that because you're pouring into you so that you can then pour into them in a major way at another point throughout the day um, is huge. And I, I can't thank you enough for for the time, for your insight and being a reflection of what it is that you're sharing. I applaud you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We truly appreciate your support because it helps us fulfill our mission of promoting cultural awareness and personal development. Please click the subscribe button below to help ensure and solidify our mission.